Hello and welcome back to the Hasbro Gen YouTube channel. It is Harry here and today it is time to take a look at what I think is the most humiliating Premier League defeat in every season since 2000, 2001. Since the concept of this video is pretty self-explanatory, I'm not going to bore you with a lengthy introduction, but I will say that I have made a video looking at the most humiliating defeats that took place in world football every year since 2000. If you want to go and check that out, I'll make sure to leave a link on the end screen of this video. And of course, if you're going to enjoy this particular video, make sure to leave a like on it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and leave a comment whether you agree or disagree with any of my selections. But without any further ado, here is what I think is the most humiliating defeat in every Premier League season since 2000-2001. 2000-2001. Arsenal 0, Middlesbrough 3. For the first inclusion in this video, I could have gone with Arsenal's 5-0 demolition of Newcastle or Manchester United's 6-1 drubbing of the Gunners, but instead I've gone with a match that won United the league that season, albeit one they weren't even involved in. It was quite simply a matter of when, and not if, the Red Devils would be crowned as league champions for a third straight season, given that they were 16 points ahead of second place Arsenal with six matches left to play. Arsene Wenger's men had to win at home against relegation threats and middle spread to keep their extremely slim title hopes alive, but in the shock results of the season, in my opinion at least, they were comprehensively beaten. Worse still, the defeat was almost entirely self-inflicted, as both Edu and Silvino scored own goals, within the space of five minutes of each other no less, to give Borough a 2-0 lead. A 54th minute goal from Hamilton Rickard put the icing on the cake for the T-Siders, who used this unlikely success as a springboard to comfortably survive relegation that season by 8 points. For Arsenal though, it was another title lost without them really putting up that much of a challenge on United, but they would return the following season with a vengeance, scoring in every single league match and leading to 2001-02. Man United 0, Arsenal 1. Yep, in the most perfect segue I may ever do on this channel, I've included the Gunners' title-winning humiliation of Manchester United for 2001-02, and admittedly, this was the only year without much competition besides this particular result. The Gunners had stormed to the top of the table by virtue of a 20-game unbeaten run, including an 11-game winning streak, and they arrived at Old Trafford full of confidence and saved for the knowledge that if they won this particular game, the title would be theirs. United responded to the challenge at hand by trying to kick the living daylights out of their opponents, with a few of their players lucky not to see red for wild challenges that came in during the first half, but they didn't knock Arsenal off their stride, who were the dominant side throughout. Their dominance was capped off in the 57th minute, when a Freddy Lundberg shot was parried by Fabian Baltes straight into the path of Sylvain Wiltor, who simply couldn't miss. United could not find a response in the minutes that followed, as their desperate attempts to go for broke and find a much needed equaliser ultimately proved futile. That meant the Gunners completed the double at the home of the team who had become their fiercely competitive rivals over the previous few years, and whilst Ferguson's charges would reclaim the title the following season, Arsenal fans will forever have that moment to cherish. 2002-03 Birmingham 3, Aston Villa 0. Local rivals Birmingham and Aston Villa hadn't met each other in the league for 14 years and not in the top flight for 16, so this particular encounter had an extra bit of spice. However, Villa was seemingly overcome by the magnitude of the occasion, allowing their hosts chance after chance to open the scoring, and the pressure finally told after 31 minutes when Olaf Melberg missed a clearance and Clinton Morrison smashed the ball home. Villa would start the second half on the front foot, but one moment of madness destroyed all of that momentum and came to define the game, ensuring it gets a spot in this video ahead of Middlesbrough beating Liverpool 4-0. On 57 minutes, Steve Staunton sent an innocuous looking throw in back to goalkeeper Peter Enkelman, but somehow the Finn let the ball slip under his foot and trickle into the back of the net. If he hadn't touched the ball, as per the rules of the game, the goal wouldn't have counted, but his reaction to letting the ball get away from him indicated that he had, no matter how slightly, and the ref agreed, awarding the goal. Suitably rattled, Villa never recovered, and another defensive howler, this time from Alpay, allowed Jeff Horsfield to rob the ball off the Turkish defender and slot home to give Birmingham all three points. The scoreline would have been bad enough to begin with, but the manner of the defeat and the own goal that will feature on every Premier League howler compilation until the end of time means this game gets the nod from me. 2003-04, Portsmouth 6, Leeds 1. Two Man United defeats, namely their 4-1 humbling by neighbours Man City and a stunning 1-0 defeat to bottom club Wolves, deserve to be mentioned, but I'm going with a result that is 
definitely slipped under the radar when it comes to all-time Premier League humiliations. Just three seasons earlier, big spending Leeds had found themselves in the semi-finals of the Champions League, with a squad boasting the likes of Rio Ferdinand, Robbie Keane, Harry Kuehl and Jonathan Woodgate. But after failing to qualify for Europe's elite competition for two seasons, with qualification to the Champions League the only way they could sustain their lavish spending, their financial black hole became inescapable. Players were sold at a rapid rate in a desperate attempt to balance the books, and as uncertainty lingered over the club, they fell down the table. By 2003-04, their debts were in excess of £100 million and almost all of their star players had gone, with Champions League football a distant memory by this point. Their decline was perhaps most emphatically summed up by a 6-1 thrashing at the hands of newly promoted Portsmouth 12 games into the season, with Patrick Berger, Yakubu, and Gary O'Neill all netting for the South Coast club in what were proved to be Leeds' joint heaviest defeat of the season. This left them on just 8 points after those 12 games and resulted in manager Peter Reid being sacked, and they eventually slipped through what had become an unavoidable relegation trapdoor at the end of the campaign. Just three years later, they were in administration and had been relegated once again, this time to League One, and it would take 16 years for them to finally return to the Premier League once more. 2004-05, Man United 2, Arsenal 0. I very nearly went with Norwich losing 3-2 to Man City, purely on the basis that Delia Smith's infamous halftime speech to the Norwich fans, with the game level at 2-2 at that point, didn't work. Let's be Avenue indeed. But realistically, there can only be one answer here, and that is Arsenal's 2-0 defeat to Man United at the most inopportune and untimely of moments. Arsenal won an English record 49-game unbeaten streak, including the entirety of their imperious 2003-04 season, and had the chance to make it a half-century at Old Trafford of all places. The two sides went in at the break with the score goalless, but just past the 70-minute mark, United were awarded a penalty, what a surprise, even though it looked like Wayne Rooney had dived. Again, what a surprise. Ruud van Nistelrooy stepped up to take it, a year after missing a spot kick against the same opponents which would have denied them the chance to go the whole season unbeaten, proceeding to get a face full of Martin Keown shouting at him in return, but he exercised those demons emphatically by slotting the ball home. United's boy Wanda Rooney, celebrating his 19th birthday that day, put the game to bed in the 90th minute, and Arsenal, in the words of John Champion, were bowled out for 49. After the match, a bust-up ensued between the two sets of players, with a slice of pizza being thrown at Ferguson by Cesc Fabregas, as the Arsenal players were outraged about the standard of refereeing in the game and how things had supposedly conspired against them. Truly damning. 2005-06, Middlesbrough 4, Man United 1. There were two seasons where my choice was absolutely nailed on before doing any research and this was one of them. Undoubtedly, Man United losing 4-1 to Middlesbrough was a damaging result in and of itself, but it's what happened after the game that made it a shoe in to feature. United headed to the Riverside at the end of October 2005, a ground where many big teams, including themselves, had come unstuck over the previous few years, and they were made to pay for a lacklustre defensive display. Uncharacteristic errors from Edwin van der Sar and Rio Ferdinand gifted Borough their first two goals, before Kieran Richardson fouled Stuart Parnaby, what a mid-2000s Premier League era combination of players that is, by the way, in the box, and Yakubu converted the resulting penalty. Gaith Kamendieta notched up his second goal of the game during the second half, and a late consolation, if you can call it that, from Cristiano Ronaldo meant nothing, as United were humbled and outclassed and found themselves 13 points behind Chelsea just 10 games into the season. After the game, injured captain Roy Keane had an interview with the club's in-house TV company, MUTV, in which he went on record blasting a number of their players, including Alan Smith, Darren Fletcher, John O'Shea and Ferdinand. The centre-back would be the one who was the subject of the bitterest of Keane's vitriol, with the Irishman quoted as saying, just because you earn £120,000 a week and play well for 20 minutes against Tottenham, you think you're a superstar. Unsurprisingly, the interview never made it to air, and Keane was swiftly sacked by United. A defeat so humiliating, it resulted in the end of a truly glorious era. 2006-07, Sheffield United 1, Arsenal 0. It came down to two games in 2006-07, namely Reading's 6-0 drubbing of West Ham and Sheffield United managing to overcome Arsenal 1-0, and after a bit of toing and froing between the two, I've gone with the latter. 
Sheffield United were sitting in 17th place when Arsenal, who were merely fighting for a Champions League place by this point, came to visit Bramall Lane on the 30th of December 2006, and they went ahead late in the first half through striker Christian Nade, one of just three league goals he would end up scoring for the Blades. However, partway through the second half, goalkeeper Paddy Kenny pulled up with an injury after taking a goal kick, and with no substitute keeper on the bench, manager Neil Warnock turned to defender Phil Jagielka, who, in fairness, had featured relatively often as a goalkeeper in his youth. Jagielka went on to have a stunning game between the sticks, repelling everything Arsenal could throw at him and keeping a clean sheet as United held on for a priceless victory, even if they would succumb to relegation come the end of the campaign. It's one of those games where the actual scoreline or even result isn't particularly humiliating per se, but when you apply context to it, in this case that a defender went in goal for 30 minutes and Arsenal still couldn't find a way past him in spite of numerous attempts to do so, it becomes exactly that. So it just about takes it for 2006-07. 2007-08, Derby 1, Newcastle 0. The obvious answer for 2007-08 is probably Middlesbrough taking Man City to the cleaners with an 8-1 trouncing, but I've gone for something a little bit different, because clearly I am a rogue who demands attention. Derby County had the worst season out of any English top flight team in history, amassing a measly 11 points across their 38 games, with a squad that was clearly ill-equipped for life in the Premier League. They scored just 20 goals, conceded 89, and lost 29 fixtures, winning only one. And that one game is the one that features here, because no one should have lost a derby that season but Newcastle did. Kenny Miller put the Rams ahead against Sam Allardyce's charges in the 39th minute, and the Magpies were unable to find a response in the time that remained, in what was probably the first indication that Big Sam was not the right man to be the manager of Newcastle United. They were extremely blunt in attack, with Derby actually looking like they would extend their lead rather than let it slip, and they held on to earn what would prove to be their only league win, and one of just three clean sheets that they would keep all season. Remarkably, they also drew two all at St James's Park in December, making Newcastle one of two teams Derby didn't lose to across the campaign, the other being Fulham. Regardless, the Geordies will have to live with the ignominious fact that they were the only team to lose to the worst team in English top flight history. I think that justifies its inclusion. 2008-09, Man City 5, Hull City 1. I would have gone with Man United's 4-1 reverse at the hands of Liverpool if the Reds had overtaken their rivals to win the title that season, with Arsenal defeats against Hull, Stoke and Chelsea all getting shouts as well. After a bit of consideration though, I've decided to give it to Man City's 5-1 battering of Hull on Boxing Day for 2008-09, for one very specific reason. On paper, this looks like a pretty run-of-the-mill result, A City, who had just been purchased by Sheikh Mansour's billions and had already signed Rubinho, simply outclassed their opponents and ran them ragged. They were 4-0 up by half-time, as Felipe Caicedo and the Brazilian superstar both scored braces, before the event which earns this game a spot in this video took place. Clearly disheartened by his side's lack of effort and spirit, manager Phil Brown decided, instead of giving his team a dressing down in the sanctity of the changing rooms, to hold it on the pitch directly in front of the travelling Hull City contingent, who must have watched on with bemusement and shock. Brown later said in his post-match interview, our 4,000 travelling fans deserve some kind of explanation for the first half performance, and it was difficult for me to do that from the confines of a changing room. We owe them an apology for the first half performance. Suffice it to say, it didn't work, as although Craig Fagan gave the supporters something to cheer in the 80th minute, Stephen Island scored two minutes later to essentially render Fagan's goal immaterial. To lose 5-1 is one thing, but to hold a half-time team talk on the pitch in response to going 4-0 down, and for it to have little effect, is quite another, and Hull would only win one more game all season, but still just about staved off relegation. 2009-10, Spurs 9, Wigan 1. Wigan's start to life under Roberto Martinez had been relatively inauspicious, barring a 3-1 win over would-be champions Chelsea, as they were sitting in 13th place after 11 games when they visited White Hart Lane. Far from what the overall narrative would have you believe, they were very much giving Spurs a game during the first half, despite falling behind after 9 minutes thanks to a Peter Crouch header, as they fashioned out a number of chances as the half wore on, and maybe should have equalised. But in the second half, the roof fell in. Jermaine Defoe scored three goals in the space of just seven minutes, the second fastest hat-trick in Premier League history at the time, and will go on to be just the third player to score five goals in a game during the Premier League era after Alan Shearer and Andy Cole. 
Aaron Lennon, David Bentley and Nico Cranshaw added some unnecessary gloss to the scoreline to give Spurs their biggest top flight win and Wigan their heaviest defeat whilst a member of the Football League, with Paul Sharnas goal to make it 3-1 nothing more than a footnote. Remarkably, the Latics would be on the wrong end of another mauling at the end of the season when they lost 8-0 to Chelsea, a result which earns a dishonourable mention, as do games such as Burnley stunning Man United 1-0 in August, Chelsea 7-1 dismantling of Aston Villa, and Sunderland beating Liverpool 1-0 by virtue of a literal beach ball. 2010-11, Liverpool 1, Blackpool 2. Roy Hodgson's appointment as Liverpool manager in 2010 was doomed from the start. Not only was the precarious state of the club's ownership still unresolved when he arrived, but the pragmatic coach's defeatist attitude in press conferences led to anger amongst the fans and a lack of confidence within his squad, as it became more evident week by week that the job was simply too big for him. The Reds only won one of his first eight league games in charge, and although a 2-0 loss to Everton within that run cannot go without mention, I've gone for the game that took place a week prior to that Merseyside derby, namely a shock defeat at home to Blackpool. It didn't start well for the Reds, with Fernando Torres limping off after 10 minutes through injury, and things got worse when Charlie Adam converted a penalty on 29 minutes to put the visitors ahead. On the stroke of half-time, Luke Varney, who had won that penalty, received a pass from Gary Taylor Fletcher and smashed the ball home to silence the cop, and despite a Sotilios Kiriakos header early in the second half and a lot of huffing and puffing, the equaliser never came. It meant the Reds had endured their worst start to a league season in 57 years and found themselves in 18th place after accruing 6 points from 7 games, and Hodgson somehow made it until January before being sacked after a ninth loss of the season away at Blackburn. Chelsea being humbled 3-0 by Sunderland to kickstart a run of just one win in 9 games, which by their standards nowadays is actually par for the course, and Newcastle thrashing the Black Cats 5-1 came close, but in the end, it's the Reds who take the wooden spoon for 2010-11. 2011-12, Man United 1, Man City 6. For years I've maintained that Man United's 8-2 drubbing of Arsenal was more damning than the 6-1 obliteration inflicted on them by Man City, but upon further reflection, I've changed my mind. Sheikh Mansour's takeover of Man City immediately made them a threat as a result of the vast amount of resources they now had at their disposal. But United manager Sir Alex Ferguson had summarily dismissed the Blues as noisy neighbours, saying they wouldn't win the league in his lifetime. However, the progress they made over the coming few years was remarkable, and in 2011-12 it was clear that they had assembled a squad built to win the Premier League and overthrow the old guard once and for all. The power shift was set in motion on the 23rd of October 2011, as United were put to the sword by a rampant City team, who thrashed them 6-1 at Old Trafford. Mario Balotelli put the hosts ahead in the first half, which led to his infamous Why Always Me shirt, before Johnny Evans saw red after fouling the Italian. Spurred on, City ran riot, with Balotelli grabbing his second of the game, before goals from Sergio Aguero, David Silva, and two from Edin Dzeko turned the result from a good victory to a seismic and era-defining result. Since then, United have won just one league title, while City have won six, including, of course, that very season on goal difference ahead of the Red Devils, thanks to a famous last gas winner from Aguero against QPR. 2012-13, Southampton 3, Man City 1. From a Man City win to a Man City defeat, and while that well and truly rammed home that City had not done enough over the summer to mount another title challenge in 2012-13. Their recruitment was poor, with a past it Mykon, Jack Rodwell, Scott Sinclair, Richard Wright and Javi Garcia, all players who would have been suitable for a pre-Emirati City, but not one with aspirations of winning the league title, and by mid-February they were already 9 points behind Man United. They went to St Mary's to face the Southampton side with a new manager in the dugout, namely Mauricio Pochettino, and the Argentine would have his first win as Saints boss, almost quite literally handed to him on a silver platter. Some abysmal defending allowed Jason Punchinson at the opener seven minutes in before an inexplicable Joe Hart error gave Stephen Davis what was essentially a free goal to put the hosts 2-0 up. Although Dzeko replied with a scruffy goal of his own, keeping in tandem with the flow of the game more broadly, the worst was still to come. After a harmless pass across the box by Ricky Lambert looked like it was going nowhere, Gareth Barry stuck out a foot to pass the ball, quite beautifully I must say, into the back of his own net, and the outgoing champions couldn't find a response in the 42 minutes that remained. 
United won their game the next day against Everton to open up an unassailable 12-point gap between the two, and Ferguson's last season in management would see him win his 13th league title. Meanwhile, City finished a distant second and sacked Roberto Mancini following a trophy this season. QPR beating Chelsea 1-0 at Stamford Bridge and Aston Villa being thrashed 8-0 by the Blues also deserve mentions in fairness. 2013-14, Chelsea 6, Arsenal 0. The storyline was supposed to be completely different. After all, it was Arsene Wenger's 1,000th game in charge of Arsenal, and even though he'd never beaten Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho in a competitive fixture, if he could break that duck on any day, surely it would be this one. Of course, what transpired was quite the opposite. Samuel Eto'o and Andre Schürrle strikes allowed the Blues to race into a 2-0 lead within seven minutes before a controversial red card for Kieran Gibbs, since it should have gone to Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain for deflecting Eden Hazard's shot wide with his hand, led to the Belgian converting from the spot to make it three. Two goals from Oscar and another from Mo Salah gave Chelsea their biggest win over the Gunners during the Premier League era, breathing new life into their title challenge and all but destroying Arsenal's. That humiliation just about edges out a host of Man United defeats that they suffered under David Moyes, not least what would prove to be his final game in charge against his old club Everton when they lost 2-0 at Goodison Park, as well as Man City annihilating Spurs 6-0 and the Citizens' losses to Cardiff and Sunderland. 2014-15, Stoke 6, Liverpool 1. Somehow, a game in which Sunderland scored three own goals and were battered 8-0 by Southampton, which probably would have featured in most other years, can't even get a look in as a result of probably the most damning game in Liverpool's recent history. Club legend Steven Gerrard had announced in January that he would be leaving Anfield at the end of the season, as he was no longer guaranteed a regular first team spot at the age of 35. So his final two games would come against Crystal Palace and Stoke at the end of the Premier League season. Liverpool somehow conspired to lose both of them, but whilst the 3-1 defeat against Palace at home was bad enough, the Stoke game was a downright embarrassment. The Potters put on a show and were 5-0 up by half-time, after Mambedam Juve's brace was added to by strikes from Charlie Adam, John Walters, and a wonder goal from Steven and Zonzi. Gerald did actually get on the score sheet in the second half, but looking at that goal more closely, and the lack of defending leading up to it, I genuinely think Stoke let him score out of sympathy given the circumstances, which somehow makes it worse. Peter Crouch ended matters with the sixth goal four minutes from time, and the Liverpool legend wasn't afforded the send-off that his career so thoroughly deserved. 2015-16, Aston Villa nil, Liverpool six. Aston Villa had been on a decline ever since Martin O'Neill's resignation as manager in 2010, and for four straight seasons, they were embroiled in relegation battles, only surviving by the skin of their teeth in 2014-15 thanks to the goals of Christian Benteke. However, after he and captain Fabian Delft departed in the off-season, the writing looked on the wall for the Midlands club, and so it proved, as they could only accrue three wins and 16 points across the campaign to finish stone dead last. The Nadir came on Valentine's Day when Liverpool came to town and, without breaking so much as a sweat, proceeded to stick six goals past the hapless Villa defence, with Emile Chan, Kolo Torre, Nathaniel Klein, Divo Carigi, James Milner and Daniel Sturridge all scoring. It was somehow made worse when defender Julian Lescott supposedly accidentally pocket-tweeted a photo of a luxury car after the game, as though that would somehow soften the blow for Villa fans. Special mentions must go to Southampton dispatching Arsenal 4-0, and Spurs somehow losing 5-1 to a 10-man Newcastle side who had already been relegated. But I don't think there can be any other candidate but a game in which involved a 6-0 demolition where the winning team probably didn't even need a post-match shower given how little effort they needed to put in. 2016-17, Hull 2, Leicester 1. This is definitely a curveball, I'm aware, but it's another one of those games where the circumstances play a huge part in why it features. Despite winning promotion to the Premier League the season prior through the playoffs, Hull City endured a summer of chaos, with manager Steve Bruce resigning after an argument with the club's owners, the first team coach being sacked and replaced by Mike Phelan on a caretaker basis, and just nine players going on a pre-season tour to Austria. What's more, they only had 11 fit outfield players for their opening game, which was a daunting clash against champions Leicester, albeit a team without the services of N'Golo Kante, who had departed for Chelsea over the summer. No matter, the Tigers defied all the odds to stun the Foxes 2-1, as Adama Diamande's bicycle kick and a strike from Robert Snodgrass cancels out the Jamie Vardy penalty. 
To go from being the Premier League champions to losing to a team who hadn't even had a full starting team during pre-season is quite something, and Leicester would end up in 12th at the end of the campaign, but Hull would ultimately drop back into the championship despite a late season resurgence under the guidance of Marco Silva. Other games that could have featured include Chelsea's 4-0 destruction of Man United in Jose Mourinho's first game back at the bridge since his sacking the previous season, and Everton comprehensively defeating Man City 4-0, after which I said Pep Guardiola should be sacked. How wrong I was. 2017-18, Man City 2, Man United 3. Man City's 5-0 demolition of Liverpool and Chelsea's 3-0 and 4-1 losses to Bournemouth and Watford respectively are edged out by City's 3-2 home defeat against their neighbours, one of just two league losses they suffered all season as a result of the circumstances surrounding the game. Simply put, if City beat second place United, they would be crowned league champions with six games left to go, which would have set an English top flight record. It looked like they would do just that with first half goals from Vincent Kompany and Ilkay Gundogan, but the Blues, most notably Raheem Sterling, squandered a number of chances to put the game to bed. Sensing a frailty about City and spearheaded by a galvanised Paul Pogba, who scored twice and assisted Chris Smalling's headed winner, the Red Devils turned the game completely on its head. Despite some last ditch attempts from City, most notably a header from Aguero which forced a phenomenal save from David De Gea, they couldn't find another goal and United kept their very, very faint title hopes alive. Missing out on a potentially once in a lifetime opportunity to win the league against your bitter rivals by throwing away a two goal lead was certainly humiliating for a fan, like me, so it features. 2018-19, Man City 6, Chelsea 0. Another Chelsea thrashing at the hands of Bournemouth, this time by four goals to nil, earns another dishonourable mention, as does Man United's tame 3-1 loss to Liverpool, which led to Jose Mourinho being dismissed. But I've gone for another Chelsea game, namely their 6-1 surrender against would-be champions Man City. Serious questions have been asked of manager Maurizio Sarri's style of play, decision to play a four-man defence with an out-of-sorts Marcus Alonso at left-back, and heavy dependence on midfield linchpin Jorginho in the weeks prior to the game and City ruthlessly exploited those frailties. It was 4-0 within 25 minutes, as goals from Raheem Sterling and Ilkay Gundogan complemented a brace from Sergio Aguero, who even managed to miss from about two yards out in that time frame too. No matter, the Argentine would complete his hat-trick with a penalty in the second half, before Sterling completed the route late on with his second. To use the immortal words of an incandescent Chelsea fan, there was no passion, vision, aggression or mindset. And although they did recover to finish third and win the Europa League, Sarri was still dismissed at the end of the campaign. 2019-20, Southampton nil, Leicester 9. Watford ending Liverpool's long unbeaten run with a script-defying 3-0 win, and Norwich outplaying incumbent champions Man City to win 3-2, both deserve a shout. But I can't look past the biggest home defeat in English top flight history. Never mind just in the Premier League era. Southampton hadn't won a home game all season up to that point, and Leicester were arguably at their post-title win peak, so it looked likely that the match would only go one way. And so it proved. Things started badly for the hosts, as not only did they find themselves 1-0 down after 10 minutes, but VAR also noticed a hefty tackle from Ryan Bertrand in the build-up to the goal, and after watching the footage, referee Andre Marada sent the left back off. From then on, the Saints capitulated, as both Jamie Vardy and Iose Perez bagged hat-tricks for the Foxes, with Yuri Tielemans and James Madison also getting themselves on the score sheet. Vardy's 94th minute penalty capped off a mesmerising Leicester performance that blew their opponents away and consigned this game to the history books for all the wrong reasons if you're a Saints fan. And based on this inclusion, I think you can guess what's coming next. 2020-21, Man United 9, Southampton 0. To lose 9-0 once can be described as an aberration or a freak result. To lose 9-0 twice in 14 months, well... That can't be mere coincidence. Southampton had lost their previous three matches, so it wasn't an ideal time to face a Man United team who were desperately trying to keep pace with runaway leaders Man City, but while some expected a heavy defeat, few could have anticipated what would unfold. Eight different players would find the back of the net, including Jan Bednarek, who put through his own net to make the score 3-0, with Anthony Martial the only player to score more than once. Dan James's 93rd minute goal made Southampton become the first team to concede nine goals in a Premier League game on more than one occasion since 1992, and in spite of fierce competition from Chelsea's stunning 5-2 loss to Big Sam's West Brom, Spurs' 6-1 drubbing of Man United, and Villa's shock 7-2 obliteration of Liverpool, I don't think I could give the dishonour to any other game that season. 2021-22, 
Man United nil, Liverpool five. There were loads of games I could have picked for last season, and most of them were Man United defeats, including their 4-0 humbling by Brighton, a 4-1 defeat against Watford, which saw Ole Gunnar Solskjaer lose his job, or either of their meek Manchester derby displays. Ultimately though, I can't overlook another United loss in the form of their 5-0 trouncing by Liverpool on their own patch, which made it clear just how far behind their rivals United were. Solskjaer was a man under pressure after a poor run of results and needed a good performance against the Reds, but they went in at the break 4-0 down following goals from Naby Keita, Diogo Jota and two from Mohamed Salah. The Egyptian would complete his hat-trick five minutes into the second half, and from then on, Liverpool completely took their foot off the gas, safe in the knowledge that their work was done and that United wouldn't lay a glove on them. To compound matters, Paul Pogba, a half-time substitute, was sent off just 15 minutes after coming on for horrendous challenge on Cater, and the streams of United fans leaving the stadium became a flood. Solskjaer was dismissed less than a month later, and the club had finished some 34 points behind Liverpool come the end of the campaign. 2022-23, Liverpool 7, Man United 0. It's yet another Liverpool Man United encounter that rounds off this video, seeing off stiff competition from Liverpool's 9-0 trouncing of Bournemouth and subsequent 1-0 loss to them later in the season, and Graham Potter's return to his former club Brighton, which saw his then employers Chelsea thrashed 4-1. Coming into the game, United had only lost once in the whole of 2023, a last minute defeat against league leaders Arsenal, had just lifted the Carabao Cup and were 10 points ahead of their rivals, who were languishing in sixth. It looked like the form book would be adhered to as United started the stronger of the two and created the better chances, but Cody Gakpo's strike just before half time swung the momentum in Liverpool's favour. They made full use of it, ripping United's defence to shreds with six second half goals, including braces from Mo Salah and Darwin Nunez. The Red Devils completely lost their heads, most notably Bruno Fernandes, whose petulance and loss of self control resulted in widespread condemnation from fans and pundits. It was United's joint heaviest defeat in their entire history, with the last time they lost by seven goals coming all the way back in 1930. And even though it looks likely that United will finish a long way above Liverpool this season, the Reds will always have that 7-0 result to fall back on. And that's the wrap of today's video looking at what I think is the most humiliating defeat of every Premier League season since 2000 2001. And if you're wondering why I didn't go all the way back to 1992-93, this video is already long enough as it is, as you can probably tell. But if you did enjoy it, of course, please don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, check out my video on the most humiliating defeats in world football every year since 2000, which should hopefully be about here or so, and make sure to ring the notification bell to never miss a video, and let me know in the comments if you agree with my decisions and which ones you would change. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, I'll see you then.